Before the war started, it took just over two hours to drive between Damascus and downtown Beirut. But the Israelis bombed several of the border crossings between Syria and Lebanon. And when I make the journey, it takes seven hours. Once inside Lebanon, we find there's a lot more traffic heading away from the besieged capital than heading towards it. More than a million people have been displaced by the Israeli attacks and the streets of Beirut are filled with refugees. At a transit point, families who've travelled from the south seek help and shelter. This family was trapped in a village near the Israeli border for 22 days while the fighting raged around them. The family's 11-year-old daughter has been missing since the war started. So yeah, this is the Shia area that was bombed two days ago. This is the closest to Beirut they have ever been. And, uh, My local guide, Maurice Al Haddad, is taking me to the scene of a recent Israeli attack in the suburb of Shia. These were two residential buildings over here. According to witnesses, a young man had fired at an Israeli drone flying overhead. The missile struck minutes later. Number is between 40 and 43 people, I think, dead and uh, around 100 wounded. Uh, mostly families, women, children, old people. And uh, as you can see, the two buildings are turned into rubble. Although the southern suburbs have been pounded by the Israeli Air Force for weeks, this was the first attack close to downtown Beirut. But this suburb is not considered a Hezbollah stronghold. They were never expecting it. These people were never expecting it because this is a, a respectively a safe area. It was a, you know. So they weren't warned at all? At all. At all. A few hours before we got here, leaflets were dropped warning of fresh attacks and most residents have fled. But in the ruins of a flat next to the bomb site, we find one man who's stayed. Does he think there's going to be an air bombing raid tonight? He said, oh yeah, he's going to We've heard the buzz of an Israeli drone flying somewhere nearby, often the only warning residents get of an impending strike. We don't want to take any chances. We don't want to be turned into a statistic, do we? No, we don't. <laughs> this is fucking crazy, man. The thing is, this enemy is, is like... It's like finding an imaginary enemy, you know what I mean? They've got air superiority. And you can never tell. I was talking to people who were born in Shia yesterday and they told us, they heard the sound like mm, boom. That's it, it's like 10 seconds, 5 seconds. Yeah. You can actually hear the bomb. Yeah, Imagine true. how frightening it is for the people who, who actually like got wounded or died. You know, you hear it for 5-10 seconds and then you're dead. Fucking crazy man. We've come to the Mount Lebanon hospital to meet survivors of the missile strike in Shia. In one of the most awful tragedies of the war, Ali Ramaiti lost 17 members of his family in the attack. Mean 
Ali's large extended family was watching television when the building was struck. We're going to the ICU to check out the boy. The only, the only, uh, the only son they have left. Nine-year-old Hussein Ramaiti said he heard the sound of the missile just seconds before the building was hit. He was under the rubble and he was unconscious until he, he uh, smelled the uh, smell of the gunpowder. He, he was awakened by that smell and he was able to wave his hand and uh, the, the rescue team was able to find him then. But they didn't know about him at all. In a separate room downstairs, we find the boy's mother. She doesn't know that three of her children are dead. The doctors plan to break the news this afternoon. They're going to bring the uh, psychologist to uh, help them uh, tell her the story bit by bit. To tell her that both of her girls and her son are dead. One of her sons is in intensive care. Uh, all her family, the, the grandmother, the grandfather, sisters, three sisters and a brother, and uh, most of her neighbours. At the hospital, I meet an American law professor, Franklin Lamb, who's also investigating the missile strike. I really want all the detail I can get while I'm here and really tell this story. This is iconic in the sense that, uh, you know, no, no human being can accept this. A former congressional aide and an international law expert, he says America supplied the missiles used in Shia. Those are our weapons, our 155 millimeter shells, our cluster bombs, our MK-84s uh, supplied uh, to Israel and allowed to violate American law, which has strong uh, prohibitions against our weapons being used uh, to kill or harm civilians. And it's being done, in a sense, in our name. Professor Lamb has written extensively about Israel's use of American weapons during the 1982 invasion of Lebanon. Now, on behalf of an American NGO, he's come back to look for fresh evidence, which he hopes to present to the US Congress in an effort to halt further weapons sales to Israel. Uh, we haven't made an conclusion yet. Uh, the overwhelming evidence is that there's been an awfully lot of indiscriminate bombing with American weapons, indeed in South uh, Lebanon, unquestionably carpet bombing. He takes me back to the bomb site in Shia and sifts through the rubble, hoping to find some trace of the weapons. It appears that there were two MK-84 guidance bombs. The MK-84 is 2,000 pounds. Uh, there's some evidence that they used two of those, but frankly, we don't know for sure. We, recently, you may know that the uh, Israelis took uh, delivery of 600 of those on a rush basis, um, and um, that's, a, that's a fair guess of what was used here, but we, we won't know uh, until we go into it very deeply. It's not just Israeli bombs raining down on Lebanon. As we're filming refugees in Sanaya Park, the Israeli Air Force drops thousands of leaflets over central Beirut. It's part of a bizarre propaganda campaign to turn the Lebanese against Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. Basically, this is just another one of those leaflets they've been dropping for the past uh, month now. Um, it's part of the uh, psychological warfare that they're waging against the, you know, the Lebanese populace. Uh, basically, this one says uh, you can bring back the um, scent of the cedars uh, and you can rub off this, uh, 
You can rub off your shoulders, uh, the destroyer of Lebanon, meaning uh, they're, they're pointing to Hassan Nasrallah. And this is the picture of the air freshener they dropped. Is that a little picture of Nasrallah there? This is Nasrallah's face, and this is the Lebanese cedar. And here it's written in Arabic, which means uh, uh, go away with a good scent, please. And uh, these are the air fresheners they've been dropping. And the police uh, have been going around the park. Uh, alerting people not to hold them in their hands or smell them because they believe they, they can, might contain some hazardous uh, chemical material or something like that. If the reactions of the refugees are any guide, the leaflets are having the opposite of their desired effect. عمل اللي عاملينه إنه لبنان دمر الأرز اللبناني يعني دمر السيد حسن دمر لبنان عم يشيلوا الشعب اللبناني يحرضوا على المقاومة فكل ما كبوا مناشير بهالشكل هيدا أو غيره سامي عم نزيد تكمشنا بالمقاومة. 23-year-old university student Sajun helps coordinate relief efforts in the park. He says the growing hatred of Israel is a logical consequence of the war. This is, will cause a revenge on the long term. It, it, it won't cause a defeat. What do you mean by that? I mean a uh, very simple thing, you know. I, I, I want to ask all Australian people, all Australian fathers, if someone have lost three kids, a wife, a father and a mother, six casualties in one minute. I just want to ask this question. Will he be defeated or will he be tough and we'll think about revenge? This is a question for the human psychology, not for, not in a Lebanese way, you know, an international human way. By day 30 of the war, with all major supply routes into Beirut cut, food supplies are dwindling. Just behind Sanaya Park, volunteers load up food parcels to distribute to the thousands of other refugees spread out across the city. The volunteers take us to an abandoned building where a family of 23 people from South Lebanon has found shelter. The Maki family left their village three days after the war started and they've been living rough ever since under the guidance of the family matriarch, Amini. <laughs> The building watchman took pity on the family and allowed them to stay. Later that night, my fixer Maurice helps out a friend at his nightclub in the hills east of Beirut. Astonishingly, although the suburbs a few kilometres away are being bombed, some young Lebanese are still determined to let their hair down. After the civil war, people got used to uh, living in, you know, hard times. So they have a, they kind of developed this way of life to deal with it. So anytime you find a conflict, you just find the Lebanese people ignoring it by going out, by having a couple of drinks, enjoying the, the atmosphere with their friends. It's Monday morning and the ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah came into effect just two hours ago. We're on our way to South Beirut to assess the damage. We're getting now into the heartland of, uh, of the southern suburbs basically. This is uh, the entrance to Hart Harek, one, uh, one of the areas that got heavily pounded. This is a Hezbollah stronghold, and although journalists are welcome, we're only admitted after being cleared by their soldiers.
It's a scene of complete and utter devastation. Dozens and dozens of apartment buildings have been levelled. The Israelis had dropped leaflets warning residents to leave the area during the bombing campaign. But everywhere there is the stench of decaying flesh. Professor Franklin Lamb has also come with us to assess the damage firsthand. Seeing it on, uh, on the uh, television isn't the same as being here. Uh, it's just hard to imagine the, the extent of the devastation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very curious to know how many weapons it took to do this, how many bombs or missiles or artillery shells. Uh, I know they pounded it and pounded it and pounded it. Does this look like precision bombing to you? Or? No, no, it's carpet bombing. It's taking an area, whatever number of blocks it is, and bombing everything in it. The opposite of precision. It's comprehensive, it's gridded, it's planned, uh, it's complete. Mm. Now the Israeli Air Force was bombing here last night, as you can probably see just behind me there's a, a plume of smoke from uh, a bomb that was just a few hour, dropped a few hours before the ceasefire. Uh, families have started to come back. Uh, it's still a little bit dangerous as you can see. This is a 12-storey building that I'm standing on right now and uh, families have come back to, to see what's left. Well clearly there's nothing much left. From, from here you can go about 10 blocks, at least 10 blocks in every direction and all of the buildings have been totally destroyed. He's not being able to locate his house. He's, just, he's not being able to locate his house. He's not being able to locate his house. I also found Lebanon's Minister for the Economy, Sami Haddad, wandering around the rubble. He was just beginning to come to terms with the damage bill. We're going to need a lot of. Uh of work and uh, we're going to be hand in hand to rebuild this as quickly as we can, but it will certainly take time. So, so this is going to have to be completely knocked down and rebuilt? I'm not an engineer, but it's obvious that many, many buildings will have to be knocked out before being rebuilt. Okay. All right, what do you, what's your assessment? Uh, you put a dollar figure on uh, so far? Yeah. You know, whatever dollar figure you put, it's certainly in the several uh, billions of dollars, at least three to four billion dollars, just to repair what has been destroyed here. Thank you, sir. <laughs> One of the reasons the southern suburbs were punished so heavily by the Israelis is that Hezbollah reportedly used the area to launch rocket attacks on Israeli warships off the coast during the early days of the conflict. Well, Franklin, uh, it, it's all very well talking about uh, American weapons, but uh, surely the Israelis have got some deep concerns too about Iranian and Syrian-made weapons. Uh, they do. That is their concern, and, I'm, uh, and uh, I, I'm no expert on that subject, but my narrow focus is American weapons. Certainly there are other weapons. In 82, the Israelis said the same thing when they use our weapons. They said, well, there's Chinese weapons here. My God, there's, there's weapons from Czechoslovakia. Uh, there's uh, Spanish weapons. Sure, there are other weapons, and someone should take up that cause. But our cause is our weapons because we've done 98% of the carnage in this part of the world with American weapons. Okay, well I'm uh, just sitting here on a, a pile of rubble. There are just piles like this everywhere. Every pile of rubble represents uh, uh, one building. Um, people are pleading with us to uh, 
to uh, tell the world the, the truth of what's happened here. People are making references all the time to September 11th and, uh, and saying really that the world doesn't care about them. So we are not a human being and they are a human being in USA. So they can compare 11 of September to this destruction and they can tell us later about democracy and the new Middle East. Of course, Hezbollah was everywhere. This was the headquarters of Al Manar, the Hezbollah television station that Israel never managed to knock off the air. Next to the ruins, I find Hezbollah member of parliament, Ali Amar. I asked him what right Hezbollah had to start a war with Israel in the name of all of the Lebanese people. <laughs> ودستورنا بالتالي يكفى الحرية التعبير حرية التعبير ولكن إنما الواقع أثبت ومن خلال تضامن كل مكونات الشعب اللبناني في مواجهة العدوان أن كل اللبنانيين بدون استثناء ملتفين في حق لبنان بالصمود لمواجهة العدوان الإسرائيلي حزب الله حزب الله ولكم حزب الله Certainly as we walked amongst the ruins of South Beirut Support for Hezbollah and its leader, Hassan Nasrallah, was unanimous. Even though this neighbourhood has been flattened, there's a sense of victory in the air. And even though the ceasefire resolution calls for Hezbollah's disarmament, the party says it reserves the right to attack Israel again. <laughs> أي محاولة العدو الإسرائيلي للنيل من سيادة لبنان واستقلال لبنان وحرية لبنان وأهلنا في لبنان بطبيعة الحال المقامة تحت فصلها. النصر يا رب الله ينصر يا رب الله يحمينا السيد حسن يا رب يا رب الله يحمينا يا يا رب الله يحمينا قائدنا السيد حسن يا رب. When I catch up with the Maki family in their abandoned building. They are busy celebrating what they see as a great victory. <laughs> there are tributes to the country's pro-Syrian president, Emil Lahoud. <laughs> Many believe Hezbollah provoked this war, which has caused untold suffering for the very people it claims to protect. But for this family, like for so many others across the Middle East, Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, is a hero. <laughs> Eh, we have to Africa, the world, the Arabic.